Hello everyone, my name is Andre, and I'm a research scientist at Uray TG Toronto. And today, together with Chenlong and Julieta, we will be talking about localization for self-driving vehicles. So self-driving cars are one of the most complex and safety critical modern day applications of robotics. And leveraging rich maps can enhance performance and safety in areas such as perception, motion forecasting, and motion planning. However, in order to leverage these HD maps, we must know our own ego position within these maps. And this is the task that is solved by localization. The goal is given a sensor observation and a pre-built map to infer the location of the vehicle within that map. And we focus explicitly on map-based localization, that is localizing within prior maps, since this is necessary in order to leverage HD maps as described in the previous section uh, in order to achieve maximum safety. Formally, we wish to model the robot's belief over its state space, where for localization, the state space typically corresponds to the robot's pose within the world. We denote the pose at the current time as xt, the observations as z, ranging from 1 to t, and we denote our prior pre-built map as m. So let's now look at what sensors are typically used to solve the task of localization. So by far the most common sensor used in this task is the Global Navigation Satellite System, or GNSS, which is a common source of input, often involved in computing initial pose estimates, which are then refined with other sensors, such as cameras, LIDARs, inertia measurement units, wheel encoders, and so on. And over the last three decades, cameras and LIDARs have been leveraged in a very, very wide variety of localization algorithms, many of which will be discussed um, later in this section. There's a wide range of representations which can be used uh, for the localization maps. So in the previous section, we saw how HD maps can be built and annotated with information such as lane boundaries, lane types, intersection types, signs, and so on. So these kinds of maps can also be used for localization. 3D geometric models can also be employed. And these models can be represented as dense or sparse point clouds, surface, surfles, or any other kinds of 3D primitives. Topological maps, are possibly non-metric graph-like representations, such as those found on OpenStreetMap, for instance. Um, and they are typically much less detailed than the semantic maps depicted here on the left. And finally, simple occupancy maps can also be used. So these are often represented simply as top-down views of the world. And these maps can also contain additional rich information, such as the surface reflectance or the color of the ground surface. And this advantage is also apparent when you want to work on compressing these maps since unlike other representations, these ones tend to be able to maintain the richness of the representations while also being uh, quite easy to compress. <clears throat> In the previous sections, we also saw the process of building and annotating HD maps. So recall that map building is typically done from multiple passes through the same area in order to ensure full coverage and robustness to that transient uh, objects such as other traffic actors. And the mapping procedure happens essentially in two steps, where first GPS inertial splines are fit uh, to multiple mapping trajectories separately using graph slam formulation. And then these are afterwards put together in a big co-registration procedure with uh, GPS and LIDAR observations in order to assemble a giant pose graph and optimize everything jointly to yield the optimal maps and produce the appearance maps. And once these steps are complete, the actual 3D appearance maps can then be readily computed from the ground truth pose and assembled. The main characteristics we would like from a localization system for self driving cars running at scale are low costs, the ability to localize in real time, high accuracy centimeter level localization qualities, as well as robustness, that is the capacity to handle and recover from possible failures. However, in order to achieve these goals, there are still several major challenges which have to be overcome. So localization systems must be robust to the presence of dynamic objects um, since these are irrelevant to localization. And for example, in dynamic busy city scenes, uh, there are very large numbers of such occluders which uh, localization systems need to be robust to. Geometrically degenerate areas, so areas which lack distinctive geometric cues can also be problematic as these areas can be challenging for geometric localizers uh, given the fact that observations cannot be uniquely aligned to the map. Sensor noise affects all sensors in different ways, 
And multipath effects, as we've seen in the previous talks, can affect both GPS and LiDAR and cause difficulties localizing. And finally, environmental changes such as construction mean that localizers must be able to adapt to cases where maps become outdated. All right, so now that we have some big picture context on what localization is actually trying to solve, it's time to kind of dive into some of the mathematical foundations of probabilistic localization systems. First, we'll talk about state space estimation, one of the core subfields of robotics. And afterwards, we will focus on the specifics for state estimation for localization. So typically, there are two main categories of parametrizations that are used for self-driving vehicle localization. The minimal parametrization has just three degrees of freedom, the latitude, the longitude, and the yaw of the vehicle with respect to the map. While very minimal, this representation makes sense for vehicles since they travel on the ground manifold and the other three degrees of freedom, namely the pitch, the roll, and the height can be readily de derived from the map. The full six degree of freedom re representation is more complete and fully describes the pose in the 3D world. It can lead to more robust state estimation albeit at the higher computational cost since you have additional degrees of freedom to estimate. And of course, it's also required for cases when the on-ground assumption no longer holds, such as, for example, in, in quad rotors and you know, just drones in general. It's also worth pointing out that we don't care about a, just the point estimate of our localization, but we also want a confidence measure over the space. So we wanna use a probabilistic framework that would allow us to model uncertainty, to track multiple post hypotheses, and to recover from failures, which is why we are actually motivated in casting localization as a probabilistic inference task, where we keep track of our belief over the entire, or at least the subset of the state space, as opposed to always just computing point estimates. So we have thus established the benefits of modeling a probability distribution over the state space rather than just a point estimate. So we, we want uncertainty modeling, we want multi-hypothesis tracking, and we wanna be able to recover from failures. So in this case, we wanna look at localization as a probabilistic inference problem. So that is estimating the belief over our state space. So for example, just latitude and longitude in this two example using some sort of observations, which in this case would be LIDAR observations, as well as a map, which can be counted as an observation and is typically denoted with this M. And we operate under the Markov assumption, where the belief over the state at time T minus one encodes all the information from all the past states, allowing us to predict where we will be at time T. And we will see why this sort of formulation, which doesn't need us to explicitly look at all previous time steps, is useful once we look at exactly how we perform this, this sort of estimation in practice. And it's also worth pointing out that we restrict our scope to the case of online localization, which assumes a good initialization is always available to solve the problem. And we will discuss global localization and system initialization later in the talk. So right now I'm gonna give a very brief overview of how the Bayesian filtering framework works in the context of localization. But it is worth pointing out that this is a very general framework that is in no way restricted just to the task of localization. So the way this method works is that there are essentially two main steps that the algorithm um, iterates over and it iterates over these as the robot moves to the environment. And these steps are essentially the prediction from the previous time step and the observation step. So on the right, we see an illustration of this Bayesian filtering procedure in practice where in the first step of the first iteration, the robot essentially has no prior knowledge over where it is in the environment. So essentially its belief over its position within this one dimensional state space is just a uniform distribution. Then in the second row, in the, second row the robot actually performs its first observation and it notices that it's near a door. Um, however, since there are multiple doors in the map, it doesn't really know where it is, so it kind of gives equal weight to all the positions near doors. However, then the robot can move. And then this is how essentially the second iteration of the algorithm starts. And in the first step of the second iteration, the robot basically propagates um, its estimate over the uncertainty based on how it decided to move. And it's worth noting that um, this 
essentially injects additional uncertainty into the into the state estimate because of course the, the measurements that the robot performs on how it how it moves are typically noisy so things like odometry or even controls uh, are are very noisy in how they actually affect the actual state and this can be seen essentially by the widening peaks um, here and finally in the second step of the second iteration the robot observes yet another door and fuses its information with the current belief and this additional information helps disambiguate the robot's pose and allows it to converge to a mostly unimodal distribution over its correct location so more formally the two steps that we iterate over are first it's the prediction step where each iteration essentially starts by using a propagation model to compute a prior relief over the current state based on the previous state's posterior. And for localization, this propagation model can be given, for example, by a kinematic model. So, you know, like you saw on the right in the example with the robot, you can have some sort of constant velocity assumption or some knowledge from your, your wheel encoders or your IMU or any sort of interoceptive sensors that kind of gives you a rough estimate on, on how you've moved from the previous time step. And then in the second step, we update this prediction based on our current observation. And this is essentially what integrates new outside information from our sensors into our belief. And uh, it's worth pointing out that this example here, um, the robot on the right is purely conceptual since in practice, it's very difficult, if not impossible to essentially solve this sort of integral um, in closed form. So we saw that proper Bayesian filtering can be a powerful framework, but that in practice, this integral over the state space is very difficult to, to work with. And it's often intractable for anything but the most trivial examples. So in practice, there's a lot of different trade-offs that can be made to actually make this tractable. So we basically have to make certain design decisions, whether we want to do a, a continuous state space estimation versus discrete, or whether we want to be able to support multiple hypotheses versus a single hypothesis system. So depending on what trade-offs we make, we can end up with uh, different types of implementations. So if we assume that our state space can be modeled by a parametric unimodal distribution, we can use a common filter. If we want to approximate our probability distributions with sampling, this yields a particle filter. And finally, if we want to discretize our state space and sort of we're, we're content with coarser estimates, um, but we're no longer sort of limited by any parametric forms or any sort of sampling, then we go with a histogram filter. And right now I'm going to basically talk about each of these implementations in a bit more detail. And then we will go into um, uh, sort of how they are used in the state of the art. So one of the oldest instantiations of recursive Bayesian filtering is the Kalman filter. So with applications ranging from the Apollo program to GPS, it's definitely one of the most common filters used in every in you know our everyday lives. So in in their standard form, Kalman filters model linear systems that are subject to Gaussian noise, and as such, they are represented as uh, as compact and efficient closed form equations. So these are very computationally efficient, precise, and also amenable to wide range of applications. You can also extend these common filters to nonlinear systems by linearization, uh, but this is of course not without its downsides. However, the fundamental nature of the Gaussian um, common filters means that they are limited to single hypothesis tracking which is not sufficient in certain cases, like attempting to localize environments with repetitive structures, where multiple hypotheses have to be tracked over a period of time in order to kind of disambiguate eventually and pick the correct one. And this means that also once you kind of converge to an incorrect optimum, you cannot recover from that and you're basically stuck. Particle filters bypass the limitation of the common filter by using a non-parametric estimate for all of these probability distributions. So it's essentially just a bunch of weighted samples. And they are no longer restricted by any particular system models or noise models. And this way we can essentially support multiple distributions as well as pretty much any system we can think of, any complicated noise model that we might encounter in the real world 
and not have to worry about letterizing equations and so on. And of course, this also means that um, we have additional downsides that we need to take care of. So we need to think about the number of samples. Um, they can become computationally expensive for high dimensional state spaces uh, because at the end of the day, you still need to make sure that you have enough particles to cover all, all your modes. Um, so you may end up you know, undersampling some modes and you need to be very careful about the design to make sure that the system becomes safe, stable and the modes don't collapse. Finally, histogram filters simply discretize all or part of the state space into a set of cells, which means that similar to particle filters, they can support any distribution over the belief space since you're no longer bound by a parametric solution like with the common filters. At the same time, histogram filters can avoid the unimodal collapse risk that particle filters have and essentially sort of eliminate the need to choose the number of particles and tune this hyperparameter. However, of course, by discretizing your state space, um, you end up limiting the resolution of your estimate. And at the same time, you have to store a very large table of probabilities, more or less, uh, which can become computationally and memory intensive as the dimensionality of a state space um, becomes higher. So if you have something like a two or three dimensional state space, this is not that big of a deal. But if you have more sophisticated state spaces for more sophisticated robotic models, and you have like 20, 30 dimensional state spaces, this can become very complex. And later in this talk, we'll actually look at how we can bypass some of these limitations in the context of online uh, localization. So let's have a look at an example of a toy histogram filter in action. So we will see a simulated little robot attempting to localize using beacons in a 2D environment. And the ground truth pose will be depicted with a red cross, while the fixed beacon are drawn as black circles. And the robot can observe nearby beacons, um, and the observations are uh, indicated by black lines but the robot can't sense beacons that are too far away. So the histogram filter will essentially show where it thinks the robot is by, uh, by, the, by the intensity of the blue color of the grid. So note how the shape of the probability distribution starts off with a ring-like estimate when the robot only sees a single beacon. And this then collapses into a unimodal estimate when the second beacon can disambiguate this estimate. And then it turns into a donut again when the robot loses the first beacon once more. Um, so it's worth pointing out that the highly non-Gaussian nature of this, this, uh, this non-parametric distribution becomes very obvious, right? So a common filter would struggle to model these ring-like distributions or these sort of banana-shaped distributions. Um, and it would basically not be able to kind of recover from ambiguous cases. So this, at the same time needs to keep track of every cell and the probability of every cell, which is also more, much more computationally expensive than a common filter. So this basically highlights some of the trade-offs between uh, things like uh, particle and histogram filters versus common filters. So to recap, uh, we saw that while we can elegantly model recursive Bayesian estimation using a very pretty pure mathematical form, in practice, we have to make some trade-offs in order to implement this on a real robot. And we saw, for example, that a common filter is able to produce convenient continuous closed form estimates, but it's limited in its modeling power. And its unimodal nature means that it is unable to track multiple hypotheses with it, without additional engineering. Next, we saw that particle filters can bypass some of these issues and approximate the quantities by sample. However, the modes of the distribution can still collapse and the number of particles necessary to model the distribution grows as an exponential function of the number of distributions in your state space. And finally, we saw that histogram filters can also represent arbitrary system models and arbitrary noise models without risking any sort of collapse, albeit at much higher computational uh, cost, as well as with limited resolution. Nevertheless, later in the talk, we will see how um, we can still leverage the best parts of histogram filters without the large computational costs uh, for online localization. I'll now pass the torch to Shen Long to talk about how to actually model the observation function, which is something I kind of glossed over uh, in the previous slides, and also to cover the most recent advances in the field of autonomous vehicle localization. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Shen Long Wang. I'm a research scientist at Uber ATG Toronto. I'm going to discuss a variety of existing approaches towards localization for self-driving. 
A common element in all localization efforts is the need to always integrate new observations to reason the states of the vehicles. Observations could take a wide range of different forms from direct sensor readings to a neural network that perceives a 3D scene. In our previous slides, we saw a few methods for state estimation. Now, we will look at different observation models. There are a huge number of existing approaches, and for the scope of this tutorial, we'll focus on six major categories, namely real-time kinematic systems, semantic matching, geometric alignment, camera to LiDAR matching, place recognition, and finally, LiDAR reflectance matching algorithms. Next, I will go over each one in detail. Real-time kinematic approaches uses differential GPS and IMUs to estimate the position of the car. This method can be very accurate, achieving centimeter-level accuracy, and they do not require prior knowledge about the appearance of the environment. For instance, the widely used KT dataset used the RTK to compute the localization functions. However, the downside includes poor reality when no GPS satellites are directly visible, lighting areas with large buildings and internals. At the same time, the reliance on the presence of base stations means that the area coverage is limited and hard to scale, since extending RTK operations to new areas involves setting up new base stations. Semantic localization, on the other hand, leverages compact maps, storing only semantic cues like names, signs, turns, and draw types, all of which can be stored as a vector maps, just like Google Maps we use in our daily lives. At runtime, the car must recognize these elements and matching them against the vector maps to localize. However, due to the sparsity of the cues, these approaches can hardly achieve centimeter level accuracy and struggles in areas without rich semantic cues. Examples of this approach include LOST, which relies on matching vehicle trajectory computed from odometry with road networks, and some recent work exploiting lanes and signs for localization on highways. Geometric alignment methods rely on aligning LiDAR point clouds to pre-built 3D HD maps. These methods can be very accurate, relying on well-established, conceptually simple methods that can be robust outliers, such as iterative closest point algorithms. The downside is that these methods have difficulties in geometrically degenerated cases, such as tunnels and bridges, where you could keep seeing the same geometric structures. Further, they usually require a good initialization for convergence. In addition, storing and building 3D geometric maps can be challenging and expensive. Another line of work is concerned with eliminating the needs for LiDAR in localization and only using it for building maps. This has the potential to improve scalability while maintaining accuracy. Some previous approaches to match human-made cues detected in camera images to LiDAR maps to localize. Recently, deep learning has been leveraged as well to compute robust descriptors which can be used to match camera observations to existing 3D LiDAR visual maps. While well, these methods have the potential to reduce the cost of localization mm -hmm. while maintaining the centimeter level accuracy, they typically still require a local search to estimate the vehicle post. At the same time, the need of mapping dense geometric data still represents a major cost, limiting the scalability of this line of the work. Place recognition tackles localization through retrieval. In this method, we try to recognize a place that had been seen before by matching the current observation to a database of pre-localized observations. The advantage of this method is that it doesn't require any initialization and can scale to very large areas when we need to recover from localization failures. Moreover, 
Advances in large scale retrieval are directly applicable to this problem, making it easy to scale. Unfortunately, this method do not achieve sentiment level accuracy yet and are limited by the density of the used database. More generally, it can be hard to learn place descriptors that are both compact and discriminative. LiDAR reflectance matching builds a map used LiDAR intensity imagery and matches online observations to this 2D image use simple template matching operations such as cost correlation. These methods can be more robust than geometric ones, especially in most featureless environments. It can be also implemented in a very efficient manner with high accuracy. At the same time, just like the geometric alignment methods, reflectance matching methods requires good initialization they also have relatively high map storage cost. That said, the 2.5D maps used by these approaches are typically much easier to compress than their 3D counterparts. These methods also require very precise LiDAR intensity calibration, which can limit their scalability due to the difficult nature of this procedure. Recent work has overcome the challenges by learning a deep feature map for matching in an end-to-end -end manner. First, we pass the online LiDAR sweep and the map through separate fully convolutional networks to compute correspondence embeddings. And then we convert the localization as a matching problem through computing a matching score for every pulse within the limited search range. The search range is over X, Y, and heading, so three degrees of freedom. The matching therefore yields a 3D score volumes, which corresponds to the observation probability in the Bayesian filter framework. A critical component for cell driving is that we always need to make it more scalable. So we need to overcome the challenge of storing our HD map to make it cover larger operation domains. Ideally, we might consider lossless or lossy image compression algorithms like PNG or JPEG, or even deep image compression method. But remember, these algorithms are typically optimized for perceptual quality or reconstruction quality. In our application, however, our map is only using localization, not for human perception. Thus, we can learn a compression algorithm optimized for the localization task. And this motivates us to go one step further. We incorporate a neural compression module within this network to encode the input map to a compact binary code. And we only need to store the binary code on the car. The compression module is highlighted with a gray box. This module is made end-to-end -end learnable. In other words, learning will decide what information it will keep and what to discard. Unlike prior compression work, it directly optimizes the trade-off between compression and localization accuracy, as opposed to the trade-off between compression and distortion commonly used in the general purpose compression literature. So overall in this work, we use learning to get robust and compact feature representations, and we formulate the localization problem as a state estimation problem and integrate priors into the vision filter. As a result, we have reduced the storage by three orders of magnitude with only a slight accuracy drop. And importantly, our approach is much more storage efficient and accurate than storing maps using standard lossy compression algorithms. Based on our computation, this compression allows storing a centimeter accurate localization map for the entire HD US through networks in a single hard drive. So the take home message is that when designing data compression algorithms for robotic applications, we should exploit the fact that consumers are robots instead of the humans and our goal is to preserve downstream task performance, such as localization accuracy. Here we show some qualitative results. Mm -hmm. On the left is our online LiDAR, in the middle is a map and on the right is our localization results. Vehicle posts predicted by our method is in red and ground truth is in green. Note that in these cases, we can see that our probe 
we can see that our posts and the ground truth posts are almost perfectly aligned. I will now hand it over to Julieta to talk about global localization and the importance of high quality large scale datasets for evaluating localization approaches. Thanks, Xianlong, and hello, everyone. My name is Julieta, and I'm also a research scientist at Uberi TG Toronto. Um, I'm going to be talking about global localization, and then I'm going to discuss some future research directions for this area. So the methods that we have seen so far have all been um, online localization methods, right? This means that we have a prior, and we want to update our belief of where uh, the car is at any, at any given time. So the natural question is, what, what happens when we don't have a prior? Uh, this task is known as global localization. And the motive, there's two main use cases, right? So the first one is, uh, we just started the car. And so, you know, we don't know where the car is. Maybe it was moved overnight. So we have to run localization here. And the other is, uh, we also can use this as a fail safe method for when online localization fails, uh, we need something to fall back on. Now, uh, all these methods have to do, they're called global because they have to localize in the whole, uh, in the whole map, right? Like a priori, you don't know where you are, so, you, so you, in principle, you have to search over the entire space. Why is this hard? Well, it, it basically amounts to recognizing uh, a place that you have seen before, right? Which is something that humans do all the time. The main challenge is that the same place can look very different uh, due to things like our weather or time of the day or season. Uh, or dynamic objects, right? All of these can make identifying the same place very challenging. The other, the other challenge is that uh, obtaining good training data for this is hard. So the training data that you want basically looks at this, captures the same place under many different circumstances, right? You want to see the same place when it's uh, sunny, when it's rainy, when it's cloudy, when it's snowing, uh, during the day, at, maybe at night. So you have to, so you want to make a lot of trips over the same area, but you also want to capture um, different places, right? So you probably want to make a lot of trips uh, over a year, and you also want to do this over many parts of a, of a city, for example. So it can, it can be uh, operationally challenging to collect data to train, uh, to train these methods. Um, so how do people often address this? Uh, there's basically two main approaches to global localization. The first one is called post regression. Uh, in this case, we have, uh, say, in this case, an image or a sensor reading in general. We pass it through some system, usually uh, 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 a network of some sort. And then uh, at the end of the network, we have a head that uh, regresses the, 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 the post parameterization directly. The, advantages, the advantage of this is that it's extremely fast. So, uh, you basically just have to run inference once on the network. And this, is, this, has, this has actually shown to be very accurate on relatively small areas. So say uh, around a building or one or two blocks, uh, these methods can actually work pretty, pretty well. Uh, unfortunately, they haven't been shown to work very well for, for say, uh, large scale cities. Uh, the other main approach here is called uh, retrieval based localization. The main idea here is that uh, offline, we're going to go through a bunch of uh, pre-localized uh, sensor observations. We're going to pass them through a network or somehow obtain a representation. And then we're going to store these representations in a database. Uh, we're going to have a, a mapping of, between these representations and the, the, the poses when they were captured. And then online, we're going to run the, the image through the same network. We're going to obtain a vector. And then we're going to do nearest neighbor search on this entire database. Uh, after we find the nearest neighbor, we simply copy the post of the, of the nearest neighbor that we found. The disadvantage is that obviously this is a little bit slower because, uh, well, we have to do a forward, forward pass and then we have to do the nearest neighbor search. Uh, potentially storing all these vectors can, can, have, can pose a large memory requirement. However, this method actually, these methods tend to scale well to say uh, entire cities. So we're gonna focus a little bit more on this. Um, so as I mentioned, it's, it's a little bit hard to obtain um, good training data for these methods. And uh, I'm gonna show this uh, piece of work that we have done uh, recently uh, that is focused on capturing a large scale data set for this task. 
we introduced PID30M, a dataset for large-scale localization tailored for self-driving applications. For scalable localization in a city setting, we would like a dataset to 1. Be diverse, 2. Cover an entire city, 3. Provide accurate localization ground truth. Our dataset satisfies these three criteria and does so at an unprecedented temporal and geographical scale. Our dataset includes images and LiDAR point clouds, each localized with accurate six degrees of freedom poses. We also carry a consumer grade GPS sensor, which we can use to bootstrap localization. Our dataset also provides a set of labels that allow researchers to better understand the limitations of current localization algorithms. For example, we provide sun angle, season, temperature, precipitation, and semantic segmentation as a proxy for occlusion. With over 25,000 kilometers driven, 30 million images and LiDAR readings, and an area of 50 square kilometers collected over 1,300 trips, our dataset is between 10 and 100 times larger than previous datasets released to the community. PID30M provides a challenging benchmark for large-scale localization, particularly suited to autonomous driving. We plan to create an evaluation server for automatic benchmarking and for keeping track of the progress by the community. We hope that our dataset will help researchers develop new and exciting algorithms for this task. So after collecting this data set, um, we also did some preliminary benchmarking. Uh, so, so this metric that we're showing here uh, on, on the x-axis is uh, how many queries fall within a certain distance. And this goes from uh, zero to one meter. Uh, so higher and to the left is better. Uh, we benchmark some common methods like uh, BLAD, NetBLAD, and DenseBLAD. And we realized that uh, they all have trouble achieving, say, uh, over 50% um, uh, below, say, half a meter, right? If we actually just train a simple, uh, say, uh, ResNet 50 with some average pooling or max pooling at the end, uh, we, seem to, we seem to achieve a much, much better results. Around 90% of the queries are, are returned within a meter. Mm -hmm. So another thing we can do is, instead of searching for nearest neighbors in the entire database, we can just uh, search for neighbors uh, within, say, 20 meters of where the GPS tells you where you, where you might be. And so this actually improves all the methods uh, consistently. Uh, and and it, it also improves uh, our, our uh, ResNet with, with simple pooling. Uh, we have a similar, um, so we also benchmark uh, LIDAR retrieval methods. And what we see, again, GPS is obviously the same. You know, some, some baselines like uh, PointNet with max pooling or, or PICAN or, or PNETLAT, uh, they, they do okay, but again, if we, if we train a ResNet uh, on um, bird's eye view representation, which uh, was mentioned previously in section three, for example, for, for perception, um, again, this, this seems to outperform uh, previous approaches. Again, GPS actually helps, and uh, this is a little bit uh, funny. Uh, uh, it, GPS actually can hurt a little bit uh, if the method is, is accurate enough, and that, that's because uh, GPS can often be uh, wrong for more than, uh, by, by more than 20 meters. And so then you can't recover in, in, in this case. Uh, here are some qualitative results. And so, for example, uh, this is the query. Um, these three are image retrieval methods, uh, and these three are LiDAR retrieval methods. So, for example, here we have an image at night. And uh, thanks, to the thanks to the diverse training data set that we have, so the, the, the image retrieval method actually finds an image that is in the same place. Uh, well, uh, uh, it's, uh, 61 centimeters away, but uh, the scene is a snow, right? So definitely the network has learned this invariance to, uh, to uh, the weather. Uh, but LiDAR is actually just uh, much more accurate, right? Like the distance is, is a little bit uh, closer and, and the scene is actually also different. Uh, here is another example where um, the query is uh, at some point during the evening when the sun is coming down and the image actually manages to find the same place just with, um, uh, but later at night or earlier at dawn. Uh, and again, LiDAR, LiDAR just is always consistently, uh, is most of the time, uh, more accurate. In this case, finding a scene where it's uh, raining. And here's another example, uh, say in, in, a, in a street when there, there aren't a lot of uh, features to, to latch onto, but the network still uh, finds something that is reasonably close. LiDAR, uh, again, being, being a little bit more accurate again.
Um, there are quite a bit of uh, open challenges and future directions. Uh, for once, uh, here we benchmark so uh, retrieving with images or retrieving with LiDAR separately. But if you want to use both and, and some, somehow uh, fuse them, find, find architectures that fuse the information from both, it, we have found that that is not, not trivial. Um, in general, we would also like to rely less on, on, on map building for ground to generation uh, because this is expensive. Like I said, you have to do a lot of trips and you have to do it over a large area. Um, when you train these things on a city, say like, uh, uh, say on the East Coast, and then if you want to generalize to cities on the West Coast, uh, you're probably going to have some generalization gap. Um, another interesting area of research might be just uh, learning joint local and global matching, which uh, some people have done, but actually retrieval, uh, learning learning how to do retrieval end to end is also is also challenging so the main idea here is that for example state of the art uh, approximate next neighbor search methods they actually use learned data structures which could which could potentially be learned together with the whole global and local matching uh, learning everything end to end just remains it remains computationally expensive but also conceptually challenging i i, I would say so uh just to recap um we have uh uh, in this tutorial, we, we went over localization with uh, pre-built maps. Uh, then we discussed uh, localization as spatial filtering. And then here we discussed things like Kalman filter, uh, particle filter, and histogram filter. Then we went, then we did an overview of methods for map-based localization. And then finally, we discussed uh, briefly global localization. So the future directions are mostly relying, uh, mostly reducing our reliance on, on, on HD maps. HD maps continue to be expensive to build, uh, hard to get right. Uh, another interesting area of research is doing continuous time modeling. So uh, a lot of this uh, Bayesian filter and approaches uh, discretize time, and that is uh, often not quite accurate. Uh, so, but, but doing things in a continuous way remains hard. Uh, and finally, doing things uh, multitasking, right? Like when you have a, an embedded system or even a mobile platform like a self driving car, uh, you have limited compute, you have limited memory, you have limited time. So if you can share some of the compute for localization with things like perception or prediction or planning, I think that also remains a, a very interesting area of research. Uh, here I'm just showing um, an example of uh, some recent exciting work that is doing um, localization uh, of, of uh, radar versus aerial images, which I think is also some interesting area of research. And with that, that will be the end of the uh, workshop. Thank you so much for joining, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest uh, the rest of the sessions.